This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, I'd like to offer you a really warm welcome to Epsom Methodist Church and to our evening service, a more traditional service of hymns and prayer and the ministry of God's word. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us and we worship him together in spirit and in truth. Let us begin our time together in prayer. Eternal God, source of all blessing, help us to worship you with all our heart and mind and strength. For you alone are God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. We say together words from Psalm 89. The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. We celebrate God's goodness together now as we sing our first hymn, God of all power and truth and grace. God, to you alone belong glory, honour and praise. We join with the hosts of heaven as we worship. You alone are worthy of adoration from every mouth and every tongue shall sing your praise. You create the earth by your power and save the human race in your mercy and renew it through your grace. To you, loving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be all glory, honour and praise now and for ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God.
loving God, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and turn away from what is wrong. Forgive us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and this is his gracious word to us. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. Well, this evening we continue our journey through the book of Acts and our reading this evening comes from Acts chapter 16 and verses 25 to 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptised without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're very grateful to Catherine for sharing God's word with us this evening. The jailer is an interesting character here. We see him flip from death to life, from despair to hope, from absolute desolation to the deepest joy and gratitude that anybody could feel. And that's partly to do with the behaviour of Paul and Silas. They, they were imprisoned for, um, well, they, they healed somebody who had a, a bad spirit and was earning people a lot of money um, through fortune telling. And once the evil spirit had left her and she was no longer able to do that, um, they, the owners were mad at um, Paul and Silas and had them thrown into jail. So arguably they're not in prison for the best of reasons and they would have been quite within their rights to walk out. Um, they were stripped and beaten, so obviously they'd not been treated very well as we look in um, verse 22. So there's that whipping up of public opinion against them. These are bad people. I don't know if you've ever been um, at the blunt end of a savage attack against your character. I can tell you it's not a happy place to be. And the the sense of injustice that accompanies it is it's something else. It leaves you reeling, really. However, this isn't going to be the first time that Paul sees himself being beaten for his faith and um, they, they are guarded carefully. There is no way that Paul and Silas are going to have the same sort of escape that Peter had. The orders were fierce to keep these men and to keep them safely guarded so that they could be properly 
more likely thoroughly dealt with in due course. Now, what's interesting is that I see that Paul and Silas turn to worship. And instead of bemoaning, like I would do, be on the phone, complaining, everything's gone wrong, it's all bad, they're terrible people here, our reputation's in tatters, we're all in a state of ruin. And, um, and we're in prison. I can't think of anything worse. We're in prison. It's really, really bad. But instead of telling the story of their personal misfortune, they choose to tell the story of the love of God in him. They sit and sing hymns. I bet the people who were um, charged to guard them were delighted that they got to listen to the hymn singing. I imagine they were quite good at it. But also there's that impact on the other prisoners too. The other prisoners were listening to them. So their, their conduct, not bemoaning their lot, the fact that they'd been thrown in prison for spurious reasons wasn't high on their agenda. What was high on the agenda was the fact that they were missionaries and that they had come with a message of God's love. And part of that message of God's love was to embody it, to allow it to take every part of who they were so that they might sing it out in praise and in worship. And so that's what they do. The purpose of their being on earth is to give praise to God. And it, it reminds me a bit of Daniel in the lion's den and um, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Even, they say, even if the Lord chooses not to rescue us, we know that he can and we know that God is still good. And it's that measure of confidence in God that Paul and Silas have as they sit there. It's always better when you've got somebody with you to rise to the occasion with as well or to provide the harmonies. But you can just imagine as they, they get out the Psalms and they start to sing praise and worship to God. And we've already established that there was no synagogue in this place. So these were new songs that the um, people of Philippi were listening to. It was a good thing to do. It was a good thing to praise and worship God. How many times when we find ourselves in trouble do our hearts go to worship? Maybe the Lord is talking to you about that to you today. It's It's been a, a difficult season for song worship and I'm not sure that people have properly understood, the people outside church, properly understood the needs of our hearts to be lifted in worship to God. In fact, many of my colleagues have said, oh, we don't need to, we don't need to sing in worship. But there's, there's something for me that that does, and I, I suspect for many of you, that's the case also. And one of the reasons that we've worshipped outside during the course of this um, season since Easter is so that we can worship God in song together. Even on the day when it rained, we managed to get three good ones out before the, the heavens opened and the rain came down. And the importance of that was to join together in song and to declare the goodness of God in the face of all sorts that wasn't good. Here I am in prison and God is good. Here we've just been beaten and God is in his heavens. Here we are and everything is falling to pieces. And yet he looks upon us with such kindness and he grants us his peace in the midst of the storm. How true it was for Paul and Silas, except unlike Elijah, who, when he was standing in the mouth of the cave, saw the Lord go past and God wasn't in the mighty rushing wind and God wasn't in the storm. He was in the still small voice. Here, the earthquake is that which shakes the releasing. And I wonder whether rather than it being a, a shaking for the releasing of the prisoners so that they could walk out having snuck away from the guards, it was more of the testimony 
that God wanted the jailer to see, establishing kingdom community in that place. The jailer wakes up from a deep sleep. I was just remembering the time that, that we were awoken from deep sleep by shaking of our first house in Manchester when the Pendlebury Fault rattled. It did. It rattled and the back wall of the house rattled and we woke up and I, I believe things fell off shelves um, in the high rises around Manchester at that time. It wakes you up. An earthquake wakes us up. And as it woke up the prisoners, it also woke up the jailer and the jailer realised that the, the chains would have been loosened. Everything had come adrift. Maybe his prisoners had too, and maybe he was going to be in so very much trouble. And you can see there that he's in such despair that he's about to fall on his sword. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. What terrible thing to happen to him and his reputation. However, Paul shouts, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And this is the testimony that they could have walked out, they, they could have, have got away, but the Lord had a different message. The message wasn't for him and Silas this time, the message was for the unnamed jailer. He was, it was for the, the chap who was waiting, who was guarding, who was on duty, the chap that didn't know Jesus. But and here's the thing that, that we can learn from today. In the demeanour of those who had remained, in the message of the ones who sang the hymns, there was also um, a reminder of kindness and gentleness and goodness. All the Christ-like attributes that, that we look for as we, we receive the Holy Spirit that gives us the charisms now, some of you are probably thinking that charisms are a, a dodgy word attached to the charismatic movement. Therefore, we, we should maybe stay away from that a little bit. But what if we look at it to see them as being the blessings of Jesus given to the people of Jesus? The charisms, the, the fruit of the Spirit of God alive and at work in us results in kindness in our behaviour, in our goodness towards one another, in our gentleness of demeanour, in the bringing in of peace wherever we find ourselves, where, where we find ourselves with hearts full of love for God and as an outpouring of that for one another. A joyful demeanour, as we saw um, Paul and Silas singing hymns I bet it wasn't the dirges, it would be ones that were full of joy, otherwise I think it would have been mentioned. Don't harm yourself, we're all here. So he rushes in and there he lays himself down before Paul and Silas, recognising the potential and seeing the goodness of their witness. Now, this has been a real time of looking at the goodness of the witness of different people throughout the Acts of Apostles and also throughout the biographies that we've been introducing over the weeks. And it's worth picking one up and reading that, maybe to, to just press pause on your Netflix or, or maybe, I don't know, maybe when the cricket's on, it's got a bit dull. You can just start to, to read a few chapters and hear the story of God's faithful people being unpacked. The witness of the faithful is about the lifestyle and the outworking of love into the communities that they then go on to serve and to bless. This past season, I've had cause to, to pause <laughs> and to think about some of those who have faithfully witnessed to God's love to me, in times of difficulty and in times of ease, in times of their own difficulty, as well as in times when, when things have been good. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my friend, Dennis. Now, Dennis was um, the leader of 
a what my organist called schism in Manchester when I was a newbie minister up there. Um, I, I remember that on when we arrived that he and Sheila came and brought us flowers and they were looking around for the minister because it couldn't possibly have been myself and Gavin because we were far too young. But there we were and we had a, a lovely welcome from them. And bit by bit I got to know Dennis and I got to know some of the amazing things he'd done. I got to know that the, the schism, so-called, had been a very painful time in his life, as well as in the life of the Methodist Church, where he'd been very clearly not wanted as the years had gone by. Now then, um, Dennis was uncompromising, and I think to be uncompromising, in the true biblical sense of it, let your yes be yes and your no, no, serves us very well. And when previous ministers, way before me, had um, not covered themselves in glory and done terrible things, Dennis had called them out for it and this hadn't gone down well. He was the grandson of a missionary who established a Christian community in Africa and then came back and worked in the UK, which was so unusual as so many lost their lives around that time. And his heart was full of that Wesleyan commitment to share the good news, to act for justice, to do what was right and to proclaim the kingdom of God in season and out of season. And I learned so much from him. When um, life wasn't easy for me as a, a minister in that area, he would bless me and encourage me. And as I got to know him, I recognised that I wondered if previous ministers had been a little bit threatened and a little bit concerned about him on their patch. And so I, um, I did what was right and made amends. Now over the years, Dennis prayed for me in so many ways. He taught me to pray. He taught me to love better. He taught me to not fly off the handle when I really, really wanted to and just to hear his stories about God entering in with grace and delivering his loving kindness at the point of people's needs was so important. Now, Dennis remained a Wesleyan even when the Methodist Church didn't want him and I, I thought that was a tremendous act of love and commitment. And to see the care and compassion, the generosity of hospitality and love which he demonstrated to the people he knew, the people who he found who were in trouble, the people who called out to him in need and actually they were trying to take him for a ride. He was a man of God and I was able to look through him and see Jesus. And that's an amazing gift to give to people. Dennis is now with his Lord and he has been for a number of years and I was thinking about his witness over the last few weeks as I've been looking at the various biographies that um, I've been offering to you. Some people have feet of clay and some people um, rise up on eagles wings and the challenge to me from that is what are you going to be Catherine? Are you going to have feet of clay or are you going to rise up on eagle's wings? Are you going to have a testimony that um, tells people about the truth of God's love in who you are and what you do, which is really hard? <laughs> or are you just going to talk the talk and not love with the measure that Christ has loved you? And that's, that's the message that goes out to each one of us. We meet Jesus and we meet him in the love of other people's kindness. We meet him through worship. We meet him through fellowship. We meet him in the breaking of bread. We meet him in sharing together. And then our hearts demand a response. The Holy Spirit of God meets with our spirit and intercedes with us in a deep, deep way. And how is God going to call out a response from you? Well, let's look at the testimony of the jailer whose story we see today. Everybody's chains had fallen off. Everybody 
my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. Everybody had that opportunity and yet the real chains fell off the heart of the jailer in that moment as he calls on the name of the Lord. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus, they say. Believe in the Lord Jesus. And as um, the jailer, who is now a believer, who is now a friend, who is now a, a, a fellow traveller, a fellow disciple on the journey, hears this word. He's baptised at once and then just look at the way he responds. At that hour of the night in verse 33, the jailer took them and washed their wounds and then he and all his household were baptised. The jailer took them and washed their wounds. And it, it reminds me of how strangers um, became friends, how the unexpected offered the sanctuary and that tenderness and love that is called out from our hearts as we place our hearts together in Christ. The Good Samaritan puts the broken man on his own animal and tends his wounds and pours oil upon them. And Jesus talks about that and we see it for real here, for real here, as hearts are changed and lives are inclined towards God. And the stories of people that, that we meet in our books, the biographies that with, with the Christians, they, they talk about lives transformed and about how God meets their needs in so many ways. So after the, the huge deal of the, um, uh, of the baptism, a meal again is set in front of Paul and Silas. We talked about hospitality and last week and about how hospitality is the mark of a fellowship, that outstretching of a hand of friendship. And we talk about how Jesus sits down and eats with tax collectors and sinners. We talk about how Peter, when he has that recognition uh, that um, that Jesus is offering a new way and a new faith, is able to kill and eat from the, the blanket that is let down from heaven. We think about how Jesus sits down with his disciples at the Last Supper and breaks bread and drinks wine and says, do this in remembrance of me. We think about how God provides manna and quail in the wilderness. We think about how there is all good things spread out for all people to live on at the very point of creation. And so many times there is a meal involved that is about that invitation to, and I think I use the word abide, to live with, to stay with. And here, the jailer, what an opportunity, what an opportunity. They're not in prison anymore, but they're in the jailer's home, tucking in to the finest food. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your household. And so that's exactly what happens. The story is told and passed on and not just a story told, but a heart changed and passed on. Not just a heart changed and passed on, but a meal shared out of that heart of love, demonstrating the kindness, the willingness to be with, that abiding with God and with God's people around the, ta the table. It's interesting that the next day in verse 35, when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order release those men. And the jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace, go in peace. And they do, they go with that word of peace, that blessing from their jailer out again. 
And the Lord made provision and he made provision for the jailer to believe and he made provision for Paul and Silas to be released without further abuse to their body. God is a good God. And we're taught about his love in so many ways by so many people. Who are your heroes of the faith? Who are the people that have led you gently by the hand? Who have sat in the room with you as you have prayed and worshipped? Who are the ones who've looked at you and said, how, how might I be saved? What do I need to do? Our Christian witness is one that is passed down from generation to generation. Our stories must be told. The times when. The things that we've learnt in faith must be shared with, with the next generation. And that's why we encourage you to join your house groups and to meet together for Bible study and fellowship and prayer. And each of our churches has places where this can be done. There is a place for you in a house group. Get in touch with a house group leader and we, or, or get in touch with me and I'll point you in the right direction. And join the prayer meeting too. Don't forget that prayer and worship, being together, setting the example of worship for the other people is so important. And then hearts and lives are changed. And you know what? You're blessed. Paul and Silas received that delicious, delicious meal, which wouldn't have been happening <laughs> otherwise. But praise and worship, the adoration of God, the shaking of the chains, the release of the jailer from his um, not knowing God to knowing Jesus in full salvation results in a blessing for those who have faithfully brought the good news of God's love to their hearts. What a saviour. What a story. Thanks be to God. Amen.
pray together prayers of thanksgiving. We praise you, eternal God, for the world which you have created and for our place in it. May you be praised for ever and ever. You have given us life that we may love and serve you. And though we have resisted your purpose and misused your gift, you have not left us in our sin, but you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. May you be praised for ever and ever. We thank you that for us he became human, died on the cross, rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven, where he reigns in glory and prays for us. May you be praised for ever and ever. We thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit to bring us to freedom and to new life in Christ. May you be praised for ever and ever. Therefore, with all your church on earth and in heaven, we give you our thanks and praise. We dedicate ourselves to you. Strengthen us by your spirit to do your will and bring us with all your saints to the glory of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And with our thanksgiving, we bring also prayers of intercession. Blessed are you, eternal God, to be praised and glorified forever. Hear us as we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Make us all one that the world may believe. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that the life of Christ may be revealed in us. Strengthen all who minister in Christ's name. Give them courage to proclaim your Gospel. Inspire and lead those who hold authority in the nations of the world. Guide them and all people in the way of justice and peace. Make us alive to the needs of our community. Help us to share each other's joys and burdens. Look with kindness on our homes and families Grant that your love may grow in our hearts. Inspire us to have compassion on those who suffer from sickness, grief or trouble. In your presence may they find their strength. We remember those who have died. Father, into your hands we commend them. We praise you for all your saints who have entered into your eternal glory. Bring us all to share in your heavenly kingdom. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. We pray you to accept and answer our prayers, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our Saviour taught his disciples, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. 
Worthy is the Lord to receive glory and honour and power. We sing together our final hymn, God is love, let heaven adore him. Well, a huge thank you to you for joining with us in worship this evening. It's been good to be with you. We offer our particular thanks to Catherine for sharing God's word with us and to the many musicians and voices who have led us so wonderfully in worship. This is the final one of our scheduled, uh, more traditional evening services. Um, as from next week, we are back to having two Sunday morning services, one at nine o'clock and one at 10.30. 10 it would be wonderful to see you if you're able to make it into church for either one of those services. If you're not, please do know that both services will be streamed online so you can catch them there if you can't come to church in person. Do check out weekly notes for details of all the other things that we have coming up, including night prayer, our new service of prayer uh, that's going to be fortnightly on the first and the third Wednesday evening of each month online from 7.30 till 8.15. We do look forward um, to seeing you again soon. And as we close, let's do so by sharing the words of grace with one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>